All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Aaron Bartlett, and I'm joined by Josh Hines. And uh, today we're going to run through a product update to bring you what's new in QNECT in 2019. And we're also going to give you a recap of the Steel Conference, both what we saw on the, the, the trade uh, room floor there, as well as uh, some of the trends that we're starting to pick up uh, in talking with our clients. Now, before we begin, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, today, attendees are in listen-only mode, and so if you have a question, there will be a slide at the very end with Josh's contact information, and you're more than welcome to reach out there. With that said, Josh, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to be discussing the first portion of today's webinar regarding some updates to QNET. All right, let's get into some product updates. So we will be reviewing the new sync button, global shear plate and single angle placement, as well as basic and advanced preference settings. Okay, for the new sync button, as many of you know, when we bring multiple sessions in, we have to compile those in a report. So if we were to bring in 50 connections in one session and delete 20 of those connections and then bring 20 new connections in, we would have two reports with 20 extra connections. So we've actually come up with our sync button. You can find it when you click on button three. You'll see it here. And all you do is simply create a new sync name. And once you're done, you will actually click sync. It will take that to your reports. So we'll do an example here. We'll sync and we're done. So now it's compiling only the QNECT connections that are physically in the model. So let's go over to our reports. Now we have the standard reports that you're used to seeing when this is selected. And then if we come over here to report by model sync, select that, we'll go to the actual DB1 file. In this case, it's a demo 2000 ton. We'll select on that webinar test. We'll move it over to the include list. We will go to all of our connections. Let's go look at our job summary. All right, here's the job summary for that webinar test. As you saw in the model, that was just a small sequence, but it did grab everything in the model that had to do with QNECT, and it has now compiled all of those into one report instead of multiple different sessions. As you can see here, it also works for the submittal package that we can put together that we're used to seeing. So for beam to beam, if we wanna to go to the groups and calcs, so on and so forth. So now let's move into global shear plate and single angle placement. We'll go back to our project, come over to the side pane and go to fabricators detailing preferences. We're going to go all the way to the bottom. Now you see the please select shear plate and single angle relative to beam web placement preference. So don't worry about the uh, greater or equal to or less than or equal to that you're going to see here in the global x-axis. Just think of this first one as your horizontal on a true north in a plan view and think of this as your vertical. So if you come in here and say far side, you're now going to have far, uh, your, your single angle or shear plate will be on the far side of your start handle and the far side of your end handle. If you wanted to have near side on the start and far side on the end, this is what it would look like. So we'll go ahead and say far for all of them. Submit that. We can come back into our model. So we're looking for far side. Right now they are on the near side, as you can see. So let's go ahead and delete these. We're also going to tell this to be a shear plate connection so we know for sure what we're looking at. And let's do a quick run.
And as always, speed is our friend here. Let's go ahead and bring these back in. And as these come in, you should see them on the far side. As you can see here, far as well as far side. So now we have more of a global approach to the placement of our shear plate and single angle. Keep in mind, if you're doing far side for everything, you still have to make sure that anything that does need to be near side is going to be done while you are prepping that ABM stick model before you run QNECT. Now if you miss something, you can always change that. Uh, and, and when you do, you can come in and force it in the QNEC tab right here. You can call it near or far for your start and your end handle. Okay, next we'll look at basic and advanced preference settings. All right, we'll come back online to our web page. So we've added three locations, basic information, connection types, and forces. Now, uh, when you look at this, this basic information will take this information here, and it's, it's pretty much the same as the general information. It's just a little bit easier to, uh, to go and find. So we'll take this, we'll come in and, and submit when we're done, and then connection types. Same thing here, you're gonna fill these out. Instead of coming over here and doing the hierarchy system in this fashion, selecting, moving up and down, it tends to take a little bit longer. So we've now added a feature where we can put the first, second, third, and fourth preference in here. So if our first preference actually was shear plate, you'll see it wipes everything else behind. So now you don't have to go select multiple areas if you only wanted shear plate. So that's just like we had before, shear only. Then we can come to shear and axial, same type of thing, shear plate, and as always when you're done, go ahead and say submit. Then we'll look at the forces tab. So this is just a condensed version of your minimum job requirements that we show at the beginning. So you have your UDL factor, uh, or you can do your, uh, your table, if we have a table, and your short span information. So now this just kind of does it very quick up, up front, and it, it just tends to be a lot faster when it's in a separate location. So that is all of our product updates. Now we can jump into some of our main webinar. All right, thanks Josh for that. Uh, we're gonna move into the next session here and talk about some real life examples, uh, some trends that we've seen as we've talked to clients and then we'll wrap this up with a discussion about what we saw at the Steel Conference and some, some trends there. So. Let's go ahead and get started, Josh. Uh, the first piece of this is um, we want to talk about a, a different way of approaching the baseline runs uh, on a job, and we've seen this quite a bit. Um, Josh has dubbed this the discovery runs, and, and Josh, I'll, uh, I'll let you kind of unpack what that looks like for um, the viewers today. Sure, so we like to start with a discovery run. Obviously, we want to start with a baseline, kind of a line drawn in the sand of, of where to go from on a project. And, uh, you know, with one of the projects more recent, we actually discovered uh, the baseline was calling for double angle bolted bolted connections. Uh, and we actually found out in the discovery run that the majority of those connections could not actually be accomplished, even though the EOR called for them. So we really started to see a trend after we did a few different runs. Single angles were working and shear plate was also working, but we had a better experience with the shear plate. So we were able to qualify that at proposal time and our client was able to win the project over with some of that VE information very early on. Yeah, good point. Yeah, so the issue with that job, if, I, if I'm recalling this correctly, was uh, there was some axial loading that the, the, uh, the double angles couldn't support, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so as part of that, you know, one of the things that we've tried to do with clients, especially early on, if we're doing an ESTA model or a very early production run, is, is take the data and run comparisons uh, using the preference optimization, uh, using the bolt optimization to see if there's a, a better option for setting up the job and allowing the client to, you know, pick and choose which route they want to go. It seems to be working pretty well, right, Josh? Yeah, it does. 
another very recent experience for us, this was actually last week where we had a project and a baseline was used at a shear plate. So we ran it as such and we had very good results, but then we dug into that with just uh, bolt optimization and reducing bolts and, and we did get rid of some there, uh, but we then ran it with single angle, uh, bolted, uh, welded, and we started noticing that single angle was giving some very good results. And we had an exact comparison, the same amount of shear plate connections we also had in single angle. And then we ran that with bolt optimization. And in the first day of discovery, we were able to find out the, uh, the total savings in tonnage from shear plate to our best run with single angle was a 16% savings. And then for uh, bolt reduction overall, we were just over 40% savings. And we also look at the weld length in inches, uh, or we can do volume if it's requested. And we were just around 20% reduction in, uh, in weld length there. So you can really see what that can do for you very early on to make uh, a more educated decision. Yeah, and this, this information is helpful, not just for uh, the fabricator, but also in this case, and I'm, I'm familiar with the example that you're giving, but this is really important for those that are doing fab interact, right? Because they can see not just how can this benefit us uh, from a shop perspective, right, as we're putting this together, but uh, also out in the field, right, for, for the installation of it. And I know in this example, the amount of welds was really critical because it was a cold, extremely cold climate. Uh, they were they were sending their crew uh, offsite, and so really every hour that we could save them was fairly significant. And uh, having this data early allowed them to go to the project team and uh, ask for a change on the setup to be approved because it would benefit the project overall. Yeah, that's right. Now, one other thing that we see quite often, and I know that you see this, it's really not uncommon, is on design drawings to have a minimum bolt row requirement. And I know that in a lot of our discovery runs as we're doing some of these early data comparisons, we're seeing um, that at times there, there are possibilities for eliminating the minimum bolt row. So can you give us an example and maybe talk through some of the, the logistical things that have happened as you've seen it um, kind of unfold in a project? Yeah, so you know, along with that discovery run that we're talking about, uh, if we have a project that has minimum bolt rows that's required, we'll notice that we do not get near as many uh, connection results as we would like on, on certain projects. And partly because, yeah, you may have, say, a W16 that requires four bolts. But if you start to get into a heavier profile and you get thicker flanges, you don't actually have room in there for those four bolts. So you can't get that connection unless there's three but we're now hindered by that minimum bolt row. Now, as soon as we uh, can qualify or remove that from the project, not only can we go down to three, but keeping T over two, uh, T over two in mind, in a lot of ways, we can still go down to two bolts and then you know, the raising gang's gonna be able to bring that in and, and stuff the two bolts. And then the bolt crew doesn't have to remobilize except for tightening. You know, so things like that really start to add up very quickly and make a very big difference. Yeah, great point, great point. So, so there's some, some real life examples of things that we've seen lately. These are, uh, I mean, we, we could probably establish them as trends now, right? We've seen enough of this uh, across the past couple quarters. Um, we'll move into now a time of review from the Steel Conference. Uh, St. Louis was a wonderful time and, and we're really thankful for everyone who attended and stopped by the booth. I know for Josh and I, it was so fun to, put faces to names for people that we've worked quite a bit with. The same goes for uh, some of our, you know, newer prospects and clients, people that are kicking the tires of Kinect. You know, thank you so much for swinging by and talking with us and, you know, working through an evaluation at this point. So I thought it'd be helpful just to talk about a couple of the trends that we saw at the conference. And, um, you know, to, to no one's surprise, probably, we had a lot of conversation around ESTA modeling, but this year felt much different than last year as far as where people were in their evaluation of how ESTA modeling could help them. And the, the breadth of conversations that we had really expanded from last year, a more fabricator-centric conversation, 
to now um, moving into other areas of the, the project management side. So Josh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about some of the conversations you had in regards to providing a connected model? Yeah, so, you know, not only, you know, like you said, not only fabricators, but now we have a lot of detailers getting in early in ESTA modeling. They want to start shifting some of their focus on not just the detailing aspect, but also bringing more value engineering capabilities to their clients, kind of positioning themselves, mm -hmm. or starting to notice some connection engineers that hire out to detailers, or connection engineers that are uh, modeling in-house, providing connected models. You know, one thing that uh, you see it a lot uh, in New York and on the East Coast right now, but it's starting to take steam other places, is a fully connected uh, superstructure model that then becomes a delivery for the fabricators to bid on. And then they take that model from its current state and they build upon that with means and methods and everything moving forward as part of their scope. Well, uh, a lot of these connection engineers that go after this are also the, the EOR of that same project, but most owners don't want to pull resources from an EOR, use them as a CE, even though they're completely separate typically, but because of that, you know, they really aren't positioned so well. Well, in this case, when while using QNECT, you actually have a pretty good leg up on the competition to not only be the EOR, but to also get even more uh, of a cut on that project as the connection engineer. Well, I think um, there's some good points you raised. You know, I, I can think of a couple of projects specifically that we've worked on in New York where this has really helped out in the sense that it's given the the EOR, um, the, the best approach for a job, and it allows them to go out and solicit fabricators who can really uh, crank that work, right? If it's set up to their preferences, then it'll then they know that that fabricator is going to come in with a, with a very uh, good bid, and that if awarded, they're going to be able to get through the work quickly because it's set up to really benefit them as a shop, right? Yeah. And that gets into the next piece uh, of... Um, I guess the next topic of conversation with which is design build design assist. I know I had a number of conversations with some some engineering firms who are looking at kind of um, using early data um, during the pursuit phase to try to win more business. Uh, we talked to <laughs> quite a few fabricators who were interested in the idea of like, hey, how can how can we as a fabricator get involved early with these design build design assist jobs? Uh, because obviously it's a it's a great place to be as a fabricator. So why don't you give us some some insight into some of the things that you saw there as well? Yeah, I had a, I also had a bunch of conversations uh, on this topic, and it just it's been more of a trend over and over through I'd say the past five six years or so. It just keeps getting uh, developed more and more, and, and it's good. It's great for the industry. So in a design build or design assist environment, uh, when you get into say a general contractor and they have that under their scope. Well, they really like it. We're starting to use some general contractors that will now use QNECT in that ESTA modeling type design build, design assist phase. And we will dig into the details from each fabricator, get their preferences. We will then provide a, a connected model for each fabricator specific, and then they can bid on a baseline bid uh, of documents, and then they will also bid on the model that's supplied from QNECT at that point. And you really start to see a very big difference from uh, from a cost aspect from, from fabricator to fabricator. General contractors love doing it. They get a great experience out of it. The engineer is also on board at that point, and it just it goes uh, very seamless. It's a good working process, great workflow. Yeah, it really allows them to be very prescriptive in the way that they bid, right? That's uh, right. Because they have all that information, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll wrap with one other topic. Um, and this was something that I'm not sure any of us saw coming. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we had uh, a chance to bring in some of the QNET clients, um, people that we really value as far as their knowledge of the industry. And um, we hosted a, uh, a session on the final day after all the parties and everything like that. Um, to talk about connection design. So we had a panel discussion. Um, it was a chance for some engineers to get some CE credits, which was great. What's interesting about this, Josh, is that there were over 120 people that attended, and I, I think it blew, it blew me away, it blew you away, I know that much. We had a lot of discussions about it. 
But tell me, why is it, why do you think it's important for a connection engineer at this phase um, to go back and take a look at connection design to, uh, to better understand what's going on in the industry? You know, give me, give me a sense of, of what your takeaways were from that. Sure. So, you know, as, as some of our, our hosts on the panel were talking about the actual connection design workflow and the, the development of that throughout the project, you know, it's not just up front during a design phase and then you're done, you know, it's constantly developing, whether that is driven by owner changes, tenant improvements, you know, whatever it's going to be, you're constantly updating that design. So if you approach that from the beginning and you're very open about the loads on a project, the design, some of the freedom that you do have, or the areas that you absolutely do not want to have freedom, if it's out in the open and you know that it's going to consistently be moving forward and you have some type of an approach to that, it doesn't really get too much better than that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, at, with QNECT, we're able to, to move on the fly. You know, what happens if a fabricator bit off more than they can chew. Maybe they have another location that they can fabricate with, or maybe they have to sub it out for some reason. And we would actually have the ability to adjust for their shop specific if it would allow in the schedule. And if the schedule wouldn't allow, we can still make up some time to catch up. Yeah, that's great. Well, Again, if you didn't have a chance to attend the STEEL conference, make plans to do so next year. It was a great opportunity to learn. Um, there's plenty of um, networking opportunities there for fabricators, for detailers. Uh, if you're looking to evaluate new equipment, obviously that's a great place to, you know, to check in and see what's going on in um, the, the, the equipment world and uh, overall just a, a great industry um, uh, time. So. With that, we'll go ahead and end today's webinar. If you do have questions, we have Josh's contact information up here uh, with his uh, cell number and his email address. We want to thank everyone for their time today and hope you have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much.